Good afternoon, and welcome to the One Book, One Minnesota Statewide Book Club with Kate DiCamillo, author of Because of Winn-Dixie. The One Book, One Minnesota program is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book in partnership with the State Library Service. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. And as such, we present programming that reaches all corners of our state and promotes reading, libraries, and our state's literary legacy. We created One Book, One Minnesota with a network of library and educational organizations to bring Minnesotans together during a time of adversity and highlight the role of libraries in our communities. Library patrons and students all over the state have been reading and discussing because of Winn-Dixie. And our event this afternoon has attendees from all over the country, in fact, nearly every state and the world. People from Alaska, New York, India, and all over Minnesota have been brought together through a love of the work of Kate DiCamillo. I'd like to thank our partners, Candlewick Press, the Council of Regional Public Library Systems Administrators, Minitex, a joint program of the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Office of Higher Education and the Minnesota Department of Education. This program is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Center for the Book through the Minnesota Department of Education. We want to hear how this program has affected you. So be on the lookout for a brief questionnaire, probably tomorrow, and we'll also send a link to the recording of today's event. Thank you all again for being part of this event today. And now I would like to hand things over to Kate's discussion partner for this afternoon, librarian Eric Bird manager of the Sunray branch of the St. Paul Public Library. Welcome, Eric and Kate. Eric, Thank hey, you, hey, everybody. Hey. Yes, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Thank you Eric. so much, Elaine. <laughs> hey. I am great. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to be a part of this event. Um, our featured guest uh, probably needs no introduction um, given the turnout, um, but let's uh, describe a few of her honors. Uh, Kate DiCamillo was born in Florida, grew up in Florida, and moved to Minnesota in her 20s, where she wrote Because of Winn Dixie. It was her first published book and became a runaway bestseller. Because of Winn Dixie, snapping up a Newberry honor as well. Because of Winn Dixie is now celebrating its 20th anniversary and has almost 12 million copies in print. Her subsequent novels went on to be National Book Award finalists, win two Newbery Medals, and in 2014, she was named the National Ambassador of Young People's Literature for the Library of Congress. Her book's themes of hope and belief amid impossible circumstances and their messages of shared humanity and connectedness have resonated with readers of all ages around the world. And that is definitely demonstrated by today's very large turnout. I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you, Kate. And we have a few questions that the audience have provided in advance. Um, at the end of those, we will also be taking questions in the Q&A box. And, and maybe I'll read too. Do you yes. want me to read? Yeah? Yeah, would you like to read the last chapter? <laughs> All right, okay. All right. I'm ready, I'm ready for that first hard question, Eric. Okay. <laughs> How does it feel looking back 20 years to the writing of, because of Winn-Dixie? Um, well, you know, I wrote, I, this is for all you Minnesotans out there. I, I wrote Because of Winn-Dixie, uh, my second uh, winter here, and uh, that was 1995, and it was a really hard, hard winter. Um, and I wrote it never thinking that I would get published, much less that I would be sitting here 20 years later, um, talking about a, a book that, that people have read and, and want to talk about it is still, I'm still kind of uh, amazed uh, by what's happened to me. Uh, the winter of 95, that was my first winter here as well. <laughs> uh, where did you come from? California. So. <laughs> so, and that was that winter, that yeah. winter. Wow, that was that was rough, but we won't we won't dwell there, you know. Yeah. And, and so and, and it's so funny that you're a California boy and I'm a Florida girl, and here we are. Warm places in that first winter of of slight regret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> 
Uh, Allison Krinky asks, what, if any, revisions would you make to Winn-Dixie after 20 years? Oh, it's a really good question. And um, it's funny because when you uh, go out and talk about a book and um, promote it, generally um, you read aloud only from the first chapter. And um, today I think I'm going to read aloud uh, from the last chapter because we've all read this book together. But generally when I'm in front of people, I'm reading from the first chapter. And that's all that I've read of this book for the last 20 years. I never, you know, I, I wrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it again and rewrote it and rewrote it. And then it became a book. And after that, I've only ever read the first chapter with all of which is to say, I'm sure there are all kinds of things in there that I would want to rewrite now, but it's, too late, isn't it? Um, although I, I do know that when I read from the very first chapter, um, there are some words in there that I, I change as I'm reading because I think, no, it would sound better this way. So a book is never really done. You're always rewriting it, I think. I have a related question on the writing process. This is from Kate Stower. She asks, what is one element of the story that you changed from your first draft to the published version? Of this story? Kate, Kate, how are you, Kate? What a great name you have, Kate. Um, let's, let's see, one element. Well, when I wrote this, um, it, it didn't have, uh, Opal was basically the only child in it. And um, I was taking a class um, and read it out loud in the class and that was went okay. And then by the time an editor got it, she said, you're gonna have to add um, some other characters who are children. And I remember saying to her, you're telling me here I baked a cake and now you're telling me you'd like me to add a couple eggs. It's impossible. But what I found out was it wasn't impossible. So I just went back to the beginning and rewrote it. And that's where uh, Sweetie Pie and uh, Amanda Wilkinson and the Dewberry Boys showed up. So do we have more process questions? I like process questions. <laughs> uh, we in fact do, we have a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> talk about writing all day. Um, how many of fo many folks are curious about writing from life? Um, and some people have wondered, are any of these characters, including, of course, when Dixie based on people and dogs, you knew? Um, for the most part, I have yet to really put a person in a book. Um, and even when Dixie uh, is an imagined dog. However, I, I went to college with a friend who had a very small little white dog named Gambetta. Um, who uh, basically had the personality of like a stalk of celery, but who did this wonderful thing uh, of sneezing and smiling. And so I took that wonderful thing that that little white dog did and I turned it into Winn Dixie, who is big and, uh, uh, and also utterly charming and full of personality. So, but for the most part, the characters, I never feel like I, base them on anybody and I never feel like I make them up. It's more like uh, they're real and I kind of discover them. Does that make sense? Uh, here's another uh, character and process question. This is from a third grade class at the Dwight Englewood School in Englewood, New Jersey. Uh, they would oh, like to know, how, they would like to know how you think of characters' names. How do I think of characters' names? Well. Um, this is one of those things where, particularly because you're, you're a third grade class, and so teachers always um, want me to say upbeat things about writing, and, and I have to say that every part of writing is really, really hard for me, so I have to tell you the truth. It's all super hard, except for the names. Uh, for some reason, names will pop into my head, um, and it's, it's, it just comes naturally to me it's one of the reasons I carry a notebook around I have a notebook with me all the time I have a notebook right now here it is and because I never know when a name is going to pop into my head so I don't know where they come from they just arrive my job is to write them down uh, 
Our next question is from Emily Roman. Uh, she wants to be a writer and she wonders, uh, how did you find uh, the story you wanted to tell? Or how did Emily. you find the story? Yeah, how did I find the story? You know, the, 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 because Winn-Dixie is the first book that I wrote and, and it is, as I've said, a book that was born of that terrible winter, homesickness for wanting uh, the warmth of Florida and also uh, for being uh, without a dog for the first time and, and, and having what I call dog withdrawal. So that first story, I found that first story through, um, through those things, through homesickness and through wanting a dog. But I find that every story that you tell um, arrives in a different way and, um, and that you, it's, you can't necessarily go out looking for it. It's like you have to show up and do the work every day and the story will come to you. But every story arrives in, in a different way. And also uh, every story is, the more unique it is to you, Conversely, the more universal it is and the more it speaks to others. So the more you write your heart, the more other people will connect with it. So you, you, you have to write the story of your heart. Thank you. Oh, we also have kind of a, a general question coming from many people. Um, many folks are curious about uh, Opal's mother. Um, and the choices you made about around that story. Yeah, so um, I get, uh, and, and this has happened from the very beginning, where I've gotten letters saying, um, why didn't Opal's mother come back at the end of the book? And I, I answer those questions by saying um, that things don't always go exactly the way we want them to, but it doesn't mean that they can't be okay. And so Opal's mother doesn't come back, but yet Opal has found this family and, uh, and she feels safe and loved. And, um, and I also get uh, a still to this day, a lot of letters um, like kind of demanding that I write a, a sequel, not only where Opal's mother comes back or but where Winn-Dixie has puppies, which is not really something that Winn-Dixie could do, but you know, or so all kinds of suggestions. I, I for a long time, I had this letter that um, I held on to, uh, and it was, I think, a, a year or two after Winn Dixie had first been published. It was this little boy in Illinois who would be a grown up now. And he wrote uh, me uh, like an 11 page letter detailing what was going to happen in Winn Dixie two, three, four, five, six, seven. The very end, after he signed his name, he put this PS at the bottom of the last page. It said, P.S. I have done all the hard work, get busy. So, I mean, there's always like this, and, and I take that as a compliment when, when a, a, a reader wants the story to keep on going, but I feel like I left Opal in a good place and, um, and that she's safe and happy. So I've never felt compelled to go back to that story. I saw a question whiz by uh, asking if uh, Gloria <laughs> was secretly Opal's mother, uh, but I guess by your answer, I, you know she's kind of symbolically, uh, geez, or grandmother. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's a beautiful point because yes, symbolically, that's right, she is. But but it it was never occurred to me. This is something else that I've found in going out and talking about um, books and stories that I write is that. Um, one, the story is never done until uh, I'm only part of it. I write it and it's not done until there's a reader reading it. And uh, two, that the reader not only completes the story, but also is a lot of times understands the story better than I do. And, and um, what I always think of when I talk about that is doing the very first um, school visit where I, uh, when Dixie had just been published, I, I went to a school to, to talk to a class of fifth graders 
And um, I stood up at the front of the class um, with the teacher and she said to the kids, this is the person who wrote this book. And now what we're gonna do is talk about the themes in this book. And I remember thinking, oh no, what, what are those? You know, here I am in front of this class and I'm supposed to be the expert. And I had no idea what the themes are. And the teacher and the kids worked together and wrote the themes of Winn-Dixie up on the chalkboard. And um, when I got out to my car, I wrote them down as I remembered them. So that the next class that I went into, I could say, okay, here are the themes in this book. But I didn't know what the themes were. It's, it's the readers and the readers sitting there talking together about a book that, and, and those themes, friendship, forgiveness, family, those themes, um, uh, keep on showing up again and again in all of my books. So it was a really good school visit for me. I learned a lot. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a question from Jay Fung. He says, all of your books are so hopeful. What keeps you writing about hope, particularly now? Uh, that's a, it's a beautiful question, Jay. Um, I, you know, it's something that, uh, well, I find hope in stories. I find hope in community and friendship and those things keep on showing up in my books. And, um, and, and I find that surprisingly, um, I, I'm a hopeful person, but you know, when I started writing, I didn't start by writing for kids. I started uh, writing short stories for adults. And then I kind of, um, stumbled into writing for kids and it's exactly where I should be and I, and I love doing it. But I always think about something that Catherine Patterson, who's a wonderful writer, Bridge to Terabithia, y'all know Catherine Patterson, right? Um, she said, when you write for children, you're duty bound to end with hope. And I didn't know that when I started writing for kids, but I, I think I felt that. And um, I love, that duty of ending with hope. And so if the story uh, is hopeful, it makes me hopeful and it spreads hope in, in the world. And that to me seems like a good thing. Well, this is our last uh, pre-submitted question. Uh, Joel Heft asks, what books are you reading during these COVID days? <laughs> I, it's funny how much rereading I've done. I have gone back and reread a, a lot. I, most of what I've been doing is rereading. So um, I'm right now with a group of friends uh, finishing up uh, Peace Like a River, um, which I've read a couple times before and um, is just a perfect book for these times. And also uh, <laughs> I'm reading Roald Dahl. Uh, the BFG, because it makes me laugh out loud. Um, and I haven't read this for probably 10 years and I'm delighting in it. Um, and I'm rereading uh, Mary Norton's uh, The Borrowers and um, I'm, I just reread Gilead. So um, a lot of rereading and some uh, new reading. I'm reading Louise Erdrich's new book and also Hilary Mantel's new book. So lots of, lots of reading. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, so is, is now, do you want me to read now, Eric? Is that what you want me to do? Oh, uh, yeah. If you'd like to, we have a short bridge where you read the last chapter and then we could go into some of the chat questions that are coming in. I, I hope that as, I've, as I read this, that um, everybody has kind of gotten to the end of the book. But, oh, well, too late now. You're going to hear it from me. And I have, I have not read this aloud since I uh, was typing it in my apartment um, 25 years ago. So let's see how it goes. Chapter 26. Outside, the rain had stopped and the clouds had gone away and the sky was so clear it seemed like I could see every star ever made. I walked all the way to the back of Gloria Dump's yard. I walked back there and looked at her mistake tree. The bottles were quiet, there wasn't a breeze, so they were just hanging there. I looked at the tree and then I looked up at the sky. Mama, I said, just like she was standing right beside me. I know 10 things about you and that's not enough. 
That's not near enough. But daddy's going to tell me more. I know he will. Now that he knows you're not coming back. He misses you and I miss you. But my heart doesn't feel empty anymore. It's full all the way up. I'll still think about you, I promise, but probably not as much as I did this summer. That's what I said that night underneath Gloria Dump's mistake tree. And after I was done saying it, I stood staring up at the sky, looking at the constellations and planets. And then I remembered my own tree, the one Gloria had helped me plant. I hadn't looked at it for a long time. I went crawling around on my hands and knees searching for it. And when I found it, I was surprised at how much it had grown. It was still small. It still looked more like a plant than a tree, but the leaves and the branches felt strong and good and right. And I was down there on my knees when I heard a voice say, are you praying? I looked up, it was Dunlap. No, I said, I'm not praying, I'm thinking. He crossed his arms and looked down at me. What about, he asked. All kinds of different things, I said. I'm sorry that I called you and Stevie bald-headed babies. That's all right, he said. Gloria told me to come out here and get you. I told you she wasn't a witch. I know it, he said. I knew it all along. I was just teasing you. Oh, I said. I looked at him close. It was hard to see him good in the dark yard. Ain't you ever going to stand up, he asked. Yeah, I said. And then he surprised me. He did something I never in a million years thought a Dewberry boy would do. He held out his hand to help me up. And I took it. I let him pull me to my feet. I'll race you back to the house, Dunlap said, and he started to run. Okay, I shouted, but I'm warning you, I'm fast. We ran and I beat him. I touched the corner of Gloria Dump's house right before he did. You shouldn't be running around in the dark, said Amanda. She was standing on the porch looking at us. You could trip over something. Ah, oh, Amanda, said Dunlap, and he shook his head. Ah, oh, Amanda, I said too. And then I remembered Carson and I felt bad for her. I went up on the porch and took hold of her hand and pulled on her. Come on, I said, let's go inside. India Opal, Daddy said, when me and Amanda and Dunlap walked in, are you here to sing some songs with us? Yes, sir, I said, only I don't know that many songs. We'll teach you, he said. He smiled at me real big. It was a good thing to see. That's right, said Gloria Dump, we will. Sweetie Pie was still sitting in her lap, but her eyes were closed. Care for a litmus lozenge, Miss Franny asked, passing me the bowl. Thank you, I told her. I took a litmus lozenge and unwrapped it and put it in my mouth. Do you want a pickle? Otis asked, holding up his big jar of pickles. No, thank you, I said, not right now. When Dixie came out from underneath Gloria Dump's chair, he sat down next to me and leaned into me the same as I was leaning into my daddy. And Amanda stood right there beside me. And when I looked over at her, she didn't look pinched faced at all to me. Dunlap cracked his knuckles and said, well, are we gonna sing or what? Yeah, Stevie echoed, are we gonna sing or what? Let's sing, said Sweetie Pie, opening her eyes and sitting up straight. Let's sing for the dog. Otis laughed and strummed his guitar and the flavor of the litmus lozenge opened in my mouth like a flower booming, all sweet and sad. And then Otis and Gloria and Stevie and Miss Franny and Dunlap and Amanda and Sweetie Pie and my daddy all started to sing a song. And I listened careful so I could learn it right. And that's the end. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's funny because it's like, it's the same as writing and that I'm sitting here alone in my house reading it out loud. Um, and, I, and yet maybe, maybe y'all heard it. <laughs> well, I'll start pulling some questions uh, from the chat uh, for you. Um, there's a question about the, uh, asking about the importance of voice in your writing and uh, how you achieve it and that kind of thing. Um, voice to me, it's like, it's one of those terrible words that you hear a lot in writing classes. Um, and it be, it's, it's terrible because it's impossible to define. Um, it's just a thing that you know when you hear it. And to me, a, every story has its own voice. And so as long as I can find the voice of a story, 
then I know the rest of it is just uh, showing up and doing the work. But the voice is everything. And, and part of the voice is getting out of your own way. And because um, I always feel like uh, the story is much smarter than I am. And so if I can put my own ego aside and listen to the voice of the story, then it's much easier to, to tell it. It's a lot of process questions, which is really kind of exciting, I have to say. I love talking process. What's next, Eric? Well, we'll do a uh, what would you question. The question is, would you uh, eat a, a lozenge? Would I eat a lozenge? Oh, absolutely, I would eat, eat a lozenge. And then, and then the, that, of course, need, leads to the next question. Uh, what kind of happy and sad would I feel? Um, and I would feel... Uh, sad that I'm not getting to uh, go out and meet readers in person. And I would feel happy that I'm getting to connect with them through things like this and through stories. Someone's also wondering, how did you feel when it was first published? <laughs> I, um, you know, I, it, the, it, it takes me back to that thing of disbelief. Um, I, I got a lot of rejection letters. Um, I, I wrote for about uh, six years before the first book came out. And uh, when I go into schools um, and, and talk about becoming a writer, um, I, I ask the kids if they, uh, I say, okay, say you've written a story and you uh, you're ready to send it out into the world. What do you get back when you send it out? And kids will always say money. <laughs> it's like, no, what you get back when you send your first stories out is a rejection letter. And then um, I asked them to guess how many rejection letters I got. Um, and usually somebody will get really wild and wacky and guess up to 50. And then I put the, the number up on the screen and the room just kind of breaks into like uh, big sounds of disbelief. I have 473 rejection letters, all of which is to say, how did I feel when Winn-Dixie get got published? Disbelieving. And there's still a part of me that is just amazed that I'm here talking to you today about a book that I wrote and that people read. Another question, uh, what did Opal teach you as a writer and how have you evolved? That is a question that nobody has ever asked in exactly that way. And I love it because a lot of times, um, because Winn-Dixie is written in the first person, um, kids in particular will think, oh, this is a story about you because it's I, I, I. And, it's, and so they think that I was Opal. And I always have to say, nope, I'm not Opal. Opal is uh, a much smarter and kinder kid than I was. And uh, I learned so much by spending uh, time with her. And so I, I learned um, a lot about reaching out to people and about trusting people and then the wonderful thing is that this book went out into the world and uh, through Opal and when Dixie, um, I got to reach out to people all over the world. And I don't, you know, it's funny because we were getting ready for this uh, 20th anniversary thing of when Dixie and um, I, ha I was at an event in DC, I think um, last fall and some uh, kid asked how many copies of Winn Dixie had been published, and I and because uh, Candlewick was doing all the numbers on stuff for the anniversary, there was an answer that I I said to the person from Candlewick there, "What is the number of? It's eleven million copies of this book have gone out into the world. So what Opal t taught me is how to connect, and it's a great gift." Now you said that you hadn't gone back and read Win Dixie um, for all these years, or just been reading the the first chapter. Yeah. Um, someone in the chat has asked, uh, "Do you uh, have you reread any of your other books, and do you have emotional reactions to them?" 
Huh. Um, I have, for the novels, I have not read any of them from beginning to end uh, as a book since they've been published. Um, the Mercy Watsons, because they're shorter, and the picture books I've read from beginning to end. Um, but emotional reactions, um, I've learned this with, um, with Edward Tulane. So it was a while after The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane had been out, and I was doing a big event and uh, some little girl raised her hand and said, don't read from the beginning of the book. That's where writers always read from the beginning of the book. Don't do that. Read from your favorite part of the book. And I said, okay. And I, I, I love the, the last chapter of Edward Tulane. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll read from that. And so I'm up there in front of all of these people and I hadn't read that out loud anywhere except in my you know, room as I was writing. And um, I, here's the emotional answer. Yes, did I get emotional? I cried so hard that it was hard to read. So yeah, there you go. That was, that taught me a lesson. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe don't read all out the last chapter of Edward Tulane, I don't know. <laughs> uh, someone else is wondering back to because of Winn-Dixie, uh, did you revise your manuscript after all those rejections? And if so, how many times? Yeah, all those rejections were not for Winn-Dixie. That was for other stories. Uh, Winn-Dixie's kind of had a charmed existence. But I rewrote Winn-Dixie anyway um, myself before I, I sent it out. So uh, I don't know. You could go to the, the here in um, Minnesota. There's a wonderful resource uh, called the Curlin Collection at the University of Minnesota where you can go and look at the rough drafts of uh, children's books writers. Also, you can look at original art from children's books. It's fantastic. And um, during these times, a lot of that is available online. So I'm not sure how many drafts there are of Because of Winn-Dixie, but you can go and look at um, all of the rough drafts of it, and, uh, and which provokes this kind of response. I sat next to somebody at a luncheon once who said that she had gone and looked at all the drafts of Because of Winn-Dixie, and um, she couldn't believe how terrible they were. And um, she thought, if I'm allowed to start a book this way, this in this messy way, then I can write a book. And she did. She was getting her first book published when I met her. So um, it, it, it's wonderful to go and, and look at how terrible my writing is and how you can watch uh, lots of different writers and see how each draft, it gets better and better. And that writing is work. So it's, it's a great resource. Another panelist is asking, uh, what gave you the strength not to give up after rejection? Yeah, you know, it's a really uh, hard question to answer. And, and the kids will ask that when I'm talking to them um, or usually after when they come through the signing line. It's like, why didn't you give up? Why didn't you give up? And, you know, part of it is that um, I, I, I knew that I wanted to be um, – a writer from the time I was in my early 20s. And I didn't start to write until I was 30. And so by the time I sat down and finally started to do it, I kind of had it in my head that, um, that I couldn't make myself talented and I couldn't make myself um, lucky, but I could make myself do the work and be relentless about putting the work out into the world. And so I think that's kind of like what kept me going was I, I can't give up because I can control these things about whether I give up or not and whether I keep sending the stories out. So I, I, I think that's what kept me going. Another panelist says, my mother teaches preschool and reads the children the Mercy Watson books all the time, and they absolutely love them. Uh, what, is your, what was your favorite part of writing them? Oh, you know, so for those of you who don't know Mercy Watson, she's um, a pig who lives with Mr. and Mrs. Watson, and they're not pigs. And um, Mercy Watson loves toast with a great deal of butter on it. And um, 
and Mr. and Mrs. Watson love mercy. That's basically the whole, the whole thing. And it's funny because when you write books for kids, people are always saying, what lesson did you mean to impart here? And those books are the answer to that question. Nothing. No one learns anything. I mean, she's like a pig and she wants toast and it's just kind of chaos and fun. So, and fun is the operative thing. You know, I, it's just a, a novel to me is, is kind of terrifying and hard work. And um, to write about that pig, all you have to do is think of a situation, put her in it. And then it is, it's just like this, it's like going to a party. It's just so much fun. And, and I've been in classrooms where I've seen uh, teachers um, have the kids, because kids have the same experience. They know mercy and the, and, the, and the teacher will have them put mercy in a situation and then the whole story unfolds. Uh, the, the, my favorite one of those was Mercy Watson, uh, well two, Mercy Watson gets eaten by Moby Dick. That was pretty funny. And Mercy Watson gets a call from the IRS. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's, it's great because all you got to do is put her in a situation and the story unfolds. Another panelist asked, as a Newbery winner, do you think the competition is healthy for the arts because of the attention it brings or does it create more of a divide? Wow, that's a really interesting question. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just, I feel so grateful to the Newberry committee for doing that every year because it brings so much attention to children's books. And I can also say this, that um, all the literary awards in the world across, you know, like into the adult, that, uh, but it's the people know that Newberry medal, like they know nothing. I mean, the average reader knows that adult or child. And so anytime somebody says the words Newberry medal to me, the mental image that flashes through my head is me at eight years old standing in front of the spin rack at Cooper Memorial Public Library. I'm eight years old. I'm looking at the yearling Newberries uh, paperbacks and, um, and I know if it's got that metal on it, that um, it's going to be a, a good book. And, and I'm eight years old and I know that. So that's, I, I think that it, it's a good thing because of, you know, how much attention it brings to children's books and how it keeps children's books in print. Speaking of libraries, uh, someone is asking well, your, your face. Yes. <laughs> What was your favorite interaction um, with a person at a library or school? Oh, well, again, that, that you asked that question and, and it's like I have another flashbulb memory and it's again me being a kid. And um, I mean, I just not I, I talk about uh, why I, I would not be here talking to you without libraries. And so to me, there was just one moment in the library um, uh, it was the public library in, in the small town that I grew up in and the head librarian came over as I was checking out my books. And uh, I was eight years old for this and um, there was a four book maximum. You could only check out four books at a time. And the head librarian came over and said to the librarian who was checking me out, you may waive the four book maximum for Kate. Kate is a true reader. She can check out as many books as she would like at a time. And it was just like this flashball moment for me of like knowing who I was and feeling seen. And um, it kind of like, I, I would, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it probably changed, you know, the course of my life. So. Hey, Eric, where'd you go? Did you leave? Am I just sitting here by myself? Eric. Oh, Eric. Hello. Hello. I can see things flying by on the screen. You are not by yourself, Kate. Oh, that's good. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, people. <laughs> people Hi, are Kate. Trying to tell me that I wasn't alone. I had to put on my glasses to see it. <laughs> uh, Kate, I'll okay. jump in. Um, I know that uh, we've been looking at so, so many questions flying by on the chat. And there have been several that have come up back to Winn-Dixie. 
and um, bringing up the characters of Gloria Dump and Otis and this idea of otherness. And, and people are really curious about how you, you came up with those characters or, or want to hear you talk about them a little bit. Yeah, it's, I did a, I did a, a radio call-in show uh, uh, last week um, and it, it got to this, um, that, that very thing uh, with, it was only kids were allowed to call in and it was great. And one kid called in and said, why did the Dewberry boys think that Gloria Dump was a witch? And um, I said, I think it's because they didn't know her. And so often when you haven't sat in somebody's yard and talked with them, you, you otherize people, you look at them and you make this decision about who they are and, and you don't know them. And so those strange characters, cause Otis is a little bit strange and so is Gloria Dump are fully formed wonderful human beings but you don't know it until, until you're with them, until you talk with them. And that's one of the things that I love so much about books and reading and it, it, it's that thing where you get to meet people who you would never meet in real life and you get to see what they're like uh on the inside and it's just like in the, it, it's that whole thing because they did that scientific study you know maybe five years ago about how reading can teach you empathy and that's how it does it you get inside other people's hearts and minds and it changes you so yeah Okay, Elaine, I see you're off the hook now because Eric made his way back. My apologies, inevitable connection troubles. I felt lost without you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we were talking of libraries and the libraries uh, <laughs> walked by goes down for a minute. <laughs> and it's moments to shine. Um, Bonnie Ruth asks, um, what was your reaction to the um, movie version of Because of Winn-Dixie? Uh, that it was really, really uh, an interesting and fun experience because I got to um, be a part of that quite a bit. I got to uh, work on the script. I got to be on the movie set, and um, and I I loved uh, the final version. And uh, I think it was for the ten year anniversary of Winn Dixie. I was in Boston and watched that movie again with. Uh, uh, in a theater with a group of people, and and I was utterly uh, charmed by it. Um, I, I think I think it's just a really sweet, dear movie. And it's so funny. I was out walking yesterday, and uh, I I uh, stopped to talk to a guy who had a dog. I'm like, what kind of dog is that? He's like, it's a Picardy Shepherd, and he's like, it's a French herding dog. No one's ever heard of them. And I wanted to say. I've heard of them because it was a Picardy Shepherd who played uh, Winn Dixie in the Winn Dixie movie. So, there's another question about uh, cover art and how much say you have over um, cover illustration and um, kind of like ups and downs of that and your favorite covers, your least favorite covers. Uh, um, I uh, I have um, contractually what's called rights of refusal. So that means that if I make a really big stink, I can stop a cover from happening. But I am in the happy position of having Candlewick Press as a publisher. And they are absolute geniuses at designing books. And so I have, you know, when I write, I have, um, I have pictures in my head that I see and, uh, of how things look. And um, it's very rare that the art then matches that what the idea that's in my head, but the, what the art does is it replaces what's in my head. And that's what, because it's so good and true. The only time um, I, what I saw as I was writing is what somebody painted is with Edward Tulane, uh, Bukram Ibatuin, who, who uh, did the illustrations that he painted what I saw, which made the hair on my arm stand up. But that's a different story. Okay, Eric, I'm ready for the next hard question. Let's, we'll do a softball quick. Okay. Uh, what's, your, what's your favorite animal? Do you have one? Oh yeah, that's a dog. Yeah, it's a dog. I do, I do, I do, I do have a favorite animal. It's a dog and I do have a dog and the dog is in the neighbor's backyard right now. And guess what? I can hear her barking, but 
She's not, you can't hear her barking, so that's great. Okay, here's a, here's a tough one. What will your next book be? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one for you. Or, it, you know, it's like when I'm standing up in front of a bunch of kids and a kid will ask that and I'll say, look, if you were to follow me out to the parking lot after this event was over and threaten me with some kind of physical violence to tell you what kind of, what book I'm working on right now, I still wouldn't do it. <laughs> and so, yeah, I can't, I, I've got a book, um, it's almost done and we haven't gotten what we call a uh, first pages yet, you know, where it's typeset, but we're close to that and it will come out in the fall and I'm not going to tell you one thing about it. <laughs> uh, there's another question. Uh, where did you write Because of Winn-Dixie? What space? Ah, that's a nice question. Um, I was in uh, uh, an apartment uh, on uh, Xerxes Avenue uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, I wrote it on a desk that was made out of a fence um, from the backyard in my house uh, that I grew up in. Yeah, that, that desk has since collapsed, so. Uh, what was your favorite part, uh, favorite part of when Dixie to write? chapter so uh the favorite part to write i you know it was a really um fun morning when i was sitting there and uh litmus lozenges showed up i didn't anticipate it i didn't know it was going to happen that was really fun but after the fact probably my favorite part is when they're all together in the backyard and uh they're standing around in gloria dump it's backyard and um, the preacher says his prayer. I love that part. Is there a particular char uh, character you especially identify with in Winn-Dixie or any of your books? Um, in Winn-Dixie, um, I, I have huge love for all of them, but there it's like, I don't really feel that, um, that there's a character that's a whole lot like me until we get to, Ramey Nightingale and that's like uh, that was that book came out in 2016 and that's the first time I kind of like put I was aware of putting my kid self into a book that the title character there Ramey. Well swinging from uh, emotion to process quickly uh, do you uh, write your books out by hand in the first drafts or do you type or what uh, I guess what's I, your I, technology I, you're writing? Yeah I, I want to just say a big shout out to um, you people in your your good questions about process. I love talking about process. I, um, I find that I have a lot more confidence if I'm typing. Um, so I, I, I carry a notebook with me all the time. I, I journal, but the stories get written on the computer and rewritten on the computer. So, and I don't think that I would be able to do it without the computer. Do you have any advice to uh, kids and students who are thinking, want to become writers? Oh, you bet I do. Um, the first thing I would say is read as much as you can um, and as many different kinds of books as you can. And then I know this sounds like a no brainer, but you have to, <laughs> you can't be like me and um, spend uh, all of your twenties wanting to do something and not doing it. If you want to write, you you have to write. And that's, it seems like that's obvious, but I spent, I wasted a lot of time not, not writing when I wanted to write. So you read, you write, you have to rewrite. Um, and no one's ever happy to hear that. Everybody thinks, well, if I'm, uh, I, I have the story I know I want to tell, I'll sit down and it will come out right the first time. It will not come out right the first time. Yet you have to, to rewrite. Um, so read, write, rewrite, keep a notebook with you all the time. For me, the notebook is a reminder to that, to pay attention to everything. So, um, I, and it's a reminder to keep everything open. So my eyes and my ears and my mind and my heart, um, cause that's your job as a writer. And then the last thing I would say is, um, you have to be persistent. Do not give up. 
can't give up. A panelist has said that uh, in the past, you've said that you write in part to make the world safe for the girl you once were, were, and he would like you to expand on that if possible. Wow, I don't even remember saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, like it, you know? <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah, and you know what, it's true. It's just like, it, and it goes back to the hope question, like um, that, um, the books have hope in them and it's uh, hard to hope right now. And uh, sometimes it, hard, it feels hard to feel safe right now, but you can, it's that idea of what we're doing right now. Um, this, there's hope and safety and connecting. And um, that's what stories help me to do. Um, and, and to connect to readers to connect um, to uh, myself and to see the world more more clearly through stories. So hope and connection, um, and that brings a, a feeling of safety. I see a younger panelist is asking, what are your three favorite colors? Three? Three favorite colors? Yeah, well, three. Green, green, green has always been my favorite color. Um, and you know what? Uh, it's a good color to have right now in Minnesota. It is so gorgeous out there. And I'm looking out there right now. And so I would have to put blue up there. It is the most beautiful blue sky. And then how about a burnt orange as my third color for autumn, which we're nowhere near, but it will come. Another panelist is saying that Opal reminds her of Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird and wonders if that, those characters had an influence on you. Oh, that's a, a beautiful compliment. Um, well, To Kill a Mockingbird is, is a beautiful, beautiful book, which I have read and reread. And so I think that um, all the books that you read influence the stories that you tell. And you're always standing on the shoulders of other storytellers, even when you're not aware that you're doing it. So sure, I, I would say that Opal probably owes a debt to Scout. Someone's also asking, uh, what is your lucky number, if you have one? A lucky number? <laughs> well, right now I'm, I'm 56, so I'll take that. Uh, have you ever considered writing poetry or any other form other than novels? Um, poetry is, is something that I've come to late in, in my reading life and I love it as a reader and I would be intimidated uh, to try and write it, but it has shown up here and there, like uh, in Flora and Ulysses, um, <laughs> which is the story of a squirrel that gets sucked up into a vacuum cleaner and who's turned into a superhero who writes poetry. Um, so the squirrel writes poetry. So I've gotten to hide behind the squirrel a little bit and write some poetry that way. You've mentioned the yearling, uh, but a panelist is wondering what books made you into a reader as a child? What books made me into a reader? I was a kid who read everything I could get my hands on. So it was kind of like I say, I read without discretion. So it, it, I had favorite books that I would come back to. There was a great biography of George Washington Carver that I loved that I checked out of the library all the time. I loved uh, Beverly Cleary's Ribsy. I loved uh, The Mouse and the Motorcycle, Stuart Little, Cricket in Times Square, Paddington. I super, super loved Paddington. But I, I just, and all those books influenced me. But I, I, I like, I read everything, everything. When you were young, what was your book situation? Did you own many or borrow from a library? Uh, this was my book situation, and, and I'm glad that somebody asked that because it's a chance for me to give a shout out to my mother who passed away uh, 11 years ago. And I, I wish that I had fully formed this thought when she was alive because she did this beautiful job of supporting me as a reader. So not only did she take me to the library twice, twice a week, but she uh, bought me books 
and uh, read to me and paid attention to what I was reading on my own. Uh, there was a point in my life where I fell in love with Abraham Lincoln. And um, my mother went out of her way to find um, books that were at my reading level about Abraham Lincoln, uh, which was hard to do in a small town in central Florida before, you know, it, she, she had to go in the next town over and special order a book and she found them for me. And so um, I was, that was a huge gift from my mother um, to take me to the library to read to me, to buy me books. That's a very beautiful tribute. Um, she, she really, she was something else. Betty DiCamello, yeah. <laughs> I'm waving at you, Betty, yeah. Uh, one panelist is asking, do you have a favorite book among your books? I can never answer that question. Um, because to me, and it is, it's, I, I say this a lot, but it is absolutely true that the books feel like my kids. So to pick a favorite is impossible. I love them equally, but differently. They're individuals to me. Another panelist is asking, did you ever have a different job? Huh? Sure. <laughs> I, I had. So uh, um, my first job was at uh, Disney World um, at Epcot Center, um, uh, telling people to watch their step. Uh, I wore a blue polyester space suit. Um, I worked at Circus World, Disney World. I worked in a greenhouse that grew variegated philodendrons. I worked in a bookstore. I worked for a book distributor. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I had lots of jobs. This is the best one. Are there folks on your publishing team who you credit with some of your, for your success? Oh, yes, yes. So not only um, an editor, um, my editor, Andrea Tampa, is just, I, she makes me a better writer and a better human being. But then there's all the people who do the work of putting the book out in the world. So the editor helps me rewrite it. The design team designs it beautifully. And then it goes out in the world and they're all, this is whole family of people that works to put that my books into librarians' hands, into bookstore hands, into parent hands. So yes, it's just like this huge group of people, all of us who really believe in what we're doing, um, which is a wonderful thing. We believe in the power of books and, and, um, and work in getting the stories out in the world. I think we're coming up on time and I would just like to thank you so much for being a part of this and sharing your process and your life with us and everyone uh, who's on board. Hey, Eric, thanks for laughing at some of my jokes and, <laughs> and to all of you, thank you. Thank you uh, because it is uh, all over the country. Thank you for reading Minnesota. Thank you for taking me in. And, uh, and thank you for that really hard winter, which uh, gave me this book. Uh, and uh, thank you to libraries everywhere. Um, you're doing amazing, important work and uh, you're putting books in the hands of people who will tell stories someday. So let's all keep reading. Great, thank you so much. And again, thank you to our partners and thank you for uh, Minnesota and everyone else for tuning in. Like Bye. it.